Thanks, Caleb. Ironically, I used to be a salesman. For those that didn't know that, before I joined YWAM, I was a salesman. And I sold spices and herbs. <laughs> let, me f let me finish my sentence. Because <laughs> I am from Holland, that all makes it even more like suspect. But uh, now, I actually, I, I worked for this company. I still don't know really why. Uh, but I worked for this company selling like, like spices and herbs wholesale to like butchers and things like that for their procedures with meat and other things. And that's what I did for four years when I had nothing else to do. And so I, I worked. And then after that, I came to Australia. But there you go. I was a salesman. I'm not sure if I was a good salesman. Uh, but, you know, I like relating to people. And so I did a lot of problem solving back then. And I feel like it was a good, good little thing for, for the future. I learned a lot. Uh, just this week, I mean, I sort of found out that I was speaking, I think, mid last week, and uh, I sort of committed to the Lord and said, well, Lord, what do you want me to speak on? And I tend to get all of these different things coming to mind. I don't know if anybody else is like that. I said, I could speak on this, and then I feel like maybe this, and then I'm speaking to this person, and that comes to the surface, and maybe we could speak on that. Uh, but it was in, uh, we had a, a meeting on Wednesday. And we're just praying. And I just felt God dropped the scripture in my mind uh, from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And uh, just the, the beginning part uh, where it actually says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And, uh, and so what I felt to speak on is probably something that we've heard lots of messages on, uh, but it's an aspect of lordship and, and surrender. And uh, specifically towards the end, I just want to look at rewards as it relates to surrender, because I think very often when we think about the message of lordship, it's like, Phew, man, I have to give up stuff, it's going to cost me something, this is tough, you know, God is going to ask me to do the things that I don't want to do, and there's processes that we go through related to lordship, and very often we look at it from that, from that angle and what it costs me, and uh, the reality is with lordship, it actually does cost us. Yes, yeah, salvation, as we all know, is for free. Uh, Jesus did everything for us, and He gave it to us. It didn't cost us anything. It cost Him everything. Uh, but then the next step is ultimately salvation actually includes lordship. But uh, lordship costs us everything. That's what we do towards God. And, uh, and so there's definitely a cost involved. It's not a, just an easy little process. It's actually an ongoing process. He is Lord, and we make Him Lord. Uh, we continuously work that through in our lives, and sometimes we feel like we're doing pretty well, and then we wake up one morning, or we find ourselves in a certain meeting, and we realize that we may be are not doing so well, and that there's room for growth. Uh, things that we thought were surrendered to the Lordship of Christ all of a sudden feel like they're no longer surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. It's an ongoing process uh, of Lordship uh, and the outworking of it, because it's not a passive process. You know, when I think about lordship, uh, you know that scripture in Psalm 24, verse 1, that uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it and the people who dwell in it. And so, ultimately, Jesus is the Lord, and He is he's not just sort of Lord, like, look at me being Lord. It's actually a function that He fulfills over our life. It's not like a, a passive position. Yeah, I can't stand here and say, look at me, I'm a Lord. Like when you're a Lord, you're always Lord over something, yeah, over someone. And so here we look at Jesus who is the Lord of everything. He is the Lord of the earth and all the people that dwell in it, which includes all of us. And so it's a very active, it's a very dynamic, it's a very proactive process, this whole aspect of Lordship. You know, something that we live out uh, every day. And so, just in preparation of this message, I was just thinking about a couple of scriptures. You know, when you, you look at Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and this is probably all scriptures that we know, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 
2.18. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And I find this is just one of those all-inclusive scriptures. It's like all things, all things, all things, all things have been created through him, for him, by him, all things hold together by him. It's, it's about him, you know, and it's visible and invisible. He is Lord over the spiritual, but he's also Lord over the physical, you know. And so there's this aspect that we surrender as we come to Jesus. We surrender our spiritual life to Jesus, but we also surrender our physical life to Jesus because he is Lord over everything. He's not just Lord over the spiritual realm. He is Lord over the physical and the spiritual. And that includes everything that we do every day. Uh, it's all inclusive, this scripture to me. It doesn't leave any gaps. There's not sort of a, a hole somewhere that I can fiddle my way through, it's, it's closed, it's compact, it's sealed. And, and I love that because it gives me a lot of security. You know, when I go to Ephesians, a little bit back, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. So this is Paul to the church in Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, has, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so, it's, again, this aspect that he is above all things, yeah, that he is the absolute supreme Lord over everything. And he comes first in all things. You know, uh, I, I was thinking actually about this, like, related to someone coming first in all things. You know, I love sports. I don't know if there's anybody else that loves sp sports. I used to be highly competitive. Uh, I'm still competitive, but not highly competitive. And that's probably too because I, I just play sports less. I've slowed down. I've gotten heavier, less fit. And so you just have to be less competitive or else you just get bitterly disappointed all the time. And, uh, but there's this aspect, you know, when I was growing up, I remember I... I, I loved, well, I loved playing sports, I loved playing soccer, and uh, I didn't love running, but I was good at running, like long distance running, I just, something that I just did pretty well, but there was always this one kid that always was just a little bit faster, and he, uh, he came first in everything, all the time, we'd be running, and then I'd be really trying, I'd be running myself into the ground, and this kid always came first in everything. And I was like thinking, you know, related to Jesus, related to who he is, he has first place in everything. He always comes first. He always is above. He always is way beyond um, my capacity, my ability. Uh, he is first, you know, in everything that he does. Uh, and not in a competitive way. That he's just beyond our understanding. He's beyond our capacity. He's beyond our wisdom. And he deserves first place. Because he comes first in everything. He deserves first place. He deserves first place in my life. And, uh, you know, when I look at that scripture again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, you know, that I am to sanctify him as Lord in my heart. I am to sanctify him. And we all know the process of sanctification. And so when you come to Christ, you are justified, uh, you, you are declared holy, and then the whole process starts, isn't it? The process of sanctification. That where he wants to be sanctified as Lord in my heart. And to me that indicates uh, that most likely 
there is sanctification to be done, that He is not fully sanctified as Lord in my heart. There's actually aspects in my heart where maybe He is not Lord or not fully Lord. And as I was thinking, you know, a little bit about my little message tonight, you know, He, he wants to be set apart in our hearts. He wants to have first place in our hearts, uh, a special place, but He wants to have the whole place. He doesn't want anything else to be in that place that could actually steer us away from what He has for us and where He wants us to go. And, you know, I think about this particular Scripture, the context of this Scripture, yeah? Bible scholars and people that do schools of the Bible, we love context, yeah? And this particular Scripture is, of course, written to the scattered church through the Roman Empire uh, under uh, a guy called Nero who was incredibly wicked and evil and used to burn Christians on the stake and do all of those things, yeah? And these people were going through turmoil, and these people uh, were going through all sorts of stuff related to their commitment to Christ, yeah? Uh, standing up for what they believed, and here is Peter, and he writes them, and he says to them, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Be unwavering, be firm, be strong as it relates to your commitment, you know, and ultimately, bottom line, when we look at the Scripture, Lordship is an issue of the, of the heart. It's not just something that we do. It's actually something that comes from deep within, where I actually conclude, yeah, that He deserves everything, that He is first in everything that I do. And I don't want to be unsanctified in my heart. You know, that Scripture in Psalm 68, that's sort of been ringing through my head all all day today and yesterday, but Psalm 68, verse 11, teach me your ways that I may walk in your truth. Give me a undivided heart. Different translations say, unite my heart. Yeah, God wants our heart to be united. God wants our heart not to be divided. He doesn't want two aspects to us. He wants one aspect. He, he wants us to be focused on Him, you know, in the aspect that we can't serve two masters. Yeah, we, we can't, when I think about lordship, the two masters that we could serve is, of course, God himself and myself. Yeah, we can all serve God and we can all serve self. But God wants to bring us to a place where we serve him, where we're completely devoted to his purposes for our lives and as it relates to the nations of the earth. He wants to unite our heart. He wants our mind, our will, and our emotions to come in line with everything that He represents, yeah, with everything that He is and everything that He wants from us. Uh, our mind, our will, and our emotions coming under the Lordship of Christ. How I feel to come under the Lordship of Christ. Uh, how I think to come under the Lordship of Christ. The decisions that I make to come under the Lordship of Christ. You know, and this, for me, what I'm talking about tonight has very much been a big part of my, my personal journey. I, you know, a lot of people might know my story, and I'm not going to really go in depth, but I, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home and then walked away from God, like, altogether uh, through different circumstances, but predominantly my own choices. I walked away from God uh, and got really lost in all sorts of stuff, uh, different aspects of addictions, uh, but just lost my way, completely lost my way. Uh, then I got really stuck, I uh, got actually quite paranoid as it relates to what was going on in my mind because of different choices that I'd made, and I started going back to church, and uh, I found it incredibly challenging because I was going to church, uh, but you know, you're talking about a divided heart. My heart was completely divided. Yeah, I would go to church on Sunday and live for me and myself, and for me and myself, and also for me and myself for the rest of the week, yeah? I was very consumed with living for me. And so that went on for about two and a half years, and there was a whole bunch of stuff that I was involved in still related to aspects of addiction that I just couldn't walk away from. And to be honest, didn't really want to walk away from uh, because I was so divided uh, in my heart and in my commitment. Uh, frustrated, deeply frustrated about this Christian walk, you know? I thought that Jesus was there to help us and to save us and to set us free. But see, the issue for me was, was a lack of surrender. It was just a total lack of surrender. So I somehow stumbled into youth with a mission, 
and it was definitely a stumble. Uh, it's a whole other story together. But I ended up doing a DTS in July of 1998. Uh, I came as a backpacker to Australia, and I met YWAM, and I got introduced to YWAM, and then I ended up doing a DTS. And uh, man, I find it tough. I find it tough because all of a sudden I joined this group of people that are really serious about God and His purposes. They're really serious about changing the world. They're really serious about transformed lives and Man, I wasn't there. And then deep within, at the same time, I felt like I wanted it, but I didn't know how to get there. Yeah, and, uh, and so I'm in my DTS for four weeks, and I mean, the honest truth, uh, I wasn't doing so well. Maybe that's best, best said. Probably fairly willful, uh, stubborn, prideful, arrogant, uh, rebellious, independent. Yeah, I don't know if anybody that was there when I came for my DTS wants to add anything. Uh, There's probably plenty to add, but I was, I mean, I was selfish, and I was, I was just unsurrendered, completely unsurrendered. And so I'm in my DTS, and there's all these people that are starting to go after God, and they're starting to really get serious with their relationship with God, and I wasn't getting it. So I was getting increasingly uh, frustrated. I felt like the gap in relationship with these people, was growing bigger and bigger. And so I came to a position on my DTS that I thought, you know what? Because this is what I used to do. You know, this is, I'll look, look at that later, but a real sign of people that are unsurrendered, they can be a bit shifty, yeah? I was going to do the silent departure. I was going to leave uh, because I, I just didn't know what to do. And I think that's more than anything. I just didn't know where to go. And uh, so here I am, Friday week four, and through a whole bunch of circumstances that Friday in class. Uh, all of a sudden, I find myself crying in class uh, and surrendering my life to Jesus. Because for the first time in my life, I, I understood that I needed Jesus. But for the first time in my life, I also understood that if I wanted to move forward in my relationship with God, there was, surrender was needed. I couldn't keep on living for myself and, and, and do this Christian thing. It was just not going to work. And uh, it's funny how God set it up. Somehow... If we try, it just doesn't work that way. He really wants us to surrender. And so that's what I did on my DTS. I surrendered, and I started recognizing that I had a divided heart and that I needed to deal with that. And uh, it's funny, then all of a sudden you look back upon your life. I don't know if anybody else has had that. Then all, you get revelation, you look back on your life, and you're like, man. I said, that was really not good. <laughs> man, why didn't I ever see that before? Um, it's the beauty, you get revelation, and hopefully we'll learn from that, hey, and we don't go back there again. And as I was preparing my message, I, I just felt to just give a couple of, I mean, however you want to call them, dangers of a lack of surrender, yeah. Uh, what are dangers as it relates to us not fully surrendering to God or holding on to things, you know, what could be affected? Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, maybe of saying it, or a good way of saying it. You know, one way, or one thing that could really be affected, of course, is our calling. Yeah, I put it up the top. Uh, you know, with a lack of surrender, we can really find ourselves in the wrong place. You know, with my lack of surrender, week four of DTS, I almost moved out of the door, and uh, would have been a very wrong decision. I can see that now. Back then, I find it hard to see. But there was this aspect, you know, that our calling is completely connected to our surrender. I remember actually a while ago that I was involved uh, with a whole bunch of people uh, in, in a setting as well where this one particular young man uh, felt like he had a real call to missions. And uh, I remember sitting down with him, talking to him, and he was from a place where they have beautiful mountains, uh, and God had spoken very clearly to him that he was called to work in the city. And uh, like, to me, that wasn't a big deal because I'm from a city, but it was this really big deal. And uh, God had spoken numbers of times, had confirmed it through other people that He was called to work in a particular city. And I remember talking to Him about it, and basically, the long short of it was that He packed His bags and He went home, back to the mountains. And uh, He actually did not do what God called Him to do. Now, the very sad part about this particular story that that person is no longer walking with Jesus. And I think, you know, a lack of surrender affects our calling, but it can affect 
so much more long term, hey, where we actually start drifting away from what God has for us. You know, a lack of surrender can cause a real lack of growth. There's just a lack of growth that we actually experience. You know, when it is hard, what do we do? You know, like I said on my DTS, what I wanted to do, I wanted to take the side road. I wanted to sort of depart, find the easy way. And uh, I think a lack of growth can be a real, uh, real danger or a real result, you know, of a lack of surrender, where we actually don't push through the difficult seasons. And surrender actually helps us to put through the difficult or go through the difficult seasons. And so we can always be on the move, yeah, a bit shifty. It can be a real, real danger uh, as it relates to a lack of surrender. We can be living in the moment, yeah, with a lack of surrender, we live in the moment. And so we can be guided by our immediate needs, yeah, our immediate wants. Classic story, of course, is Esau. He was hungry. Yeah, anybody else ever hungry? Yeah, lots of us. Hungry is a good thing. Yeah, it's okay. But there's this aspect, hey, Esau, he sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge or whatever, a bowl of soup, whatever it was, a bunch of lentils, yeah, because right then and there, he lived in the moment, yeah? There was a lack of surrender, I suppose, to the call uh, upon his life. You know, he was the eldest. There was something that God has for him, had for him, but something else was more important at the time. And so we can really be guided by our immediate wants and needs, and it actually can really affect our inheritance. Lack of surrender can really affect our inheritance. We can even lose our inheritance. Uh, lack of surrender uh, will determine, I think, or surrender or lack of surrender, it will determine our friendships, what kind of friendships we have, yeah, uh, what kind of people we surround ourselves with. A lack of surrender can often connect us to the wrong people, yeah, uh, wrong relationships. Lack of surrender can really, uh, I mean, I suppose the danger is there, but issues of independence, issues of a lack of submission, issues of control, yeah, um, sometimes really seen through a lack of communication, yeah, lack of processing. Uh, there's this aspect of a lack of surrender that we tend to do things on our own accord. Yeah, we might not include lots of people, but it's actually a very dangerous place, I think, because we're not made hey, to, to sort it all out ourselves. We're actually made to do it with other people. Yeah, lack of surrender uh, can really affect the person that we choose to spend the rest of our days with, uh, all sorts of things through a lack of surrender can really be affected. And I think there can be a real level of dissatisfaction with a lack of surrender. You know, we're not quite, things are not quite what we maybe wanted it to be or hope it to be. Uh, we're never really satisfied. And that can really happen through a lack of surrender. And so I would say a lack of surrender often, often not always, but often has mistrust at the foundation, uh, I used to struggle majorly with mistrust, yeah, and that's where my lack of surrender really was, was leaning on. So, has anybody here been rejected? Anyone? About five of us, ten, yeah. I mean, probably all of us. And you know, guys, if we have rejection, hey, in a background, we can all be a candidate, all of us, be a candidate for mistrust and therefore lack of surrender. Yeah, lack of surrender and mistrust are very closely connected. And so we want to be careful with that. But a couple of indications that we might have a lack of surrender. Maybe some signs on the wall. It could be unteachable. Unteachable can be a real sign of a lack of surrender. Unteachable. You know, my way is a bit better. Yeah. And because we're unteachable, we can sometimes struggle with issues of quarreling or being argumentative, yeah, or actually being in disunity with people uh, can be a real sign of a lack of surrender. Another sign of surrender can be confusion. Confusion. Lack of clarity. Lack of clarity as it relates to hearing God. We find it hard to get clarity. And it can often have to do with the fact that we have our will and God's will. And we're wrestling through. And sometimes, uh, you know, we might be guided by our feelings and we hear things that we think might be God, but we don't get peace about it. We don't, there's just a lack of peace. There's a lack of clarity. And it can really come through a lack of surrender. 
Yeah, there's a lack, lack of rest. There's maybe some internal fighting. Sometimes we fight uh, related to issues of personal freedom. Yeah, and it can really be issues of a lack of surrender. You know, a- aspects where we want to be able to do what we want to do. And so, lack of rest, um, feelings of being controlled. I used to struggle with this big time. It can be a real sign, actually, of control in your own life. Yeah? Very often we can feel that we are being controlled because we actually struggle with control. And we don't like to be controlled. Does that make sense? And we feel like we're being controlled where actually we are struggling with control ourselves and don't like to be controlled. And so feelings like that can really indicate that we're struggling yeah, with a lack of surrender. Guys, we can actually uh, feel tired and weary. Now, there's different reasons why we can feel tired and weary. Yeah, uh, I have two little children. I sometimes wake up in the morning after being up most of the night, and I go through the day, and I feel tired and weary. Yeah, there's just a level of physical tiredness that you experience. Uh, you know, people told me that that could happen as a parent, and it happened. It's awesome. Yeah. The beauty of it is, though, guys, if you're surrendered, if you're surrendered to God, you actually find a lot of grace to be able to go through that. Actually, if you're surrendered, you'll find grace. See, a lack of surrender will miss grace. And then because you miss grace, we can actually feel tired and weary in the call of God. We can actually feel tired and weary. It's not a physical tiredness and weariness. It's actually we're weary and tired related to what God has called us to do. It's too much. It's too hard. And sometimes that is because of a lack of surrender. And we just miss the grace. See, there's grace available to us to do what God has called us to do. But if we have an undivided heart, we'll get that. But if we don't have an undivided heart, we'll miss that. Yeah, and God doesn't want us to miss it. So sometimes, not always, but sometimes tiredness and weariness related to the call of God can be because of a lack of surrender. We haven't fully given over. Yeah, other aspects, uh, we could be frustrated or easily frustrated. Frustration generally indicates a lack of surrender, a lack of lordship. Aspects of comparison, competition, where we compare ourselves. We, we struggle, you know, being uh, secure in our own identity, and we might be, might be looking at what other people have, what we don't have, can be a real sign of a lack of surrender. And so, ultimately, guys, a lack of surrender has us at the center. And that will always rob us. It will always steal from us. Us at the center will always rob us and always steal from us. And it actually will cause a lack of fulfillment. Yeah, it could cause a lack in the call. It could cause a lack in all that we're called to do. It will miss the cross, and therefore it will lack intimacy with God. Yeah, Lack of surrender will miss the cross, and therefore actually we, we miss the intimacy that God has for us. And so lack of surrender uh, can really affect us. But what I really felt to talk about today uh, is rewards. <laughs> You're like, yeah, sure, sure. But rewards of surrender. Because even though we don't do it for the rewards, yeah, we don't surrender to Christ as Lord for what we can get out of it. We don't want to be selfish in a motivation related to surrender. There are actually incredible rewards as we do surrender. And um, I just want to mention a whole bunch to you uh, tonight. One of them, peace. Who likes peace? Hallelujah. I like peace. Peace is awesome. Yeah, Uh, Jesus was very clear with his disciples, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you, I do not give as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid, yeah, and so there's peace in the midst of whatever situation it is, because we've surrendered to God, yeah, surrender to God leads to peace, because I don't have to make it happen. I'm not the final authority. I'm not the final responsibility. Yeah, I actually have surrendered. And so peace can be a real sign of surrender. Yeah, that we have surrendered. Clarity to hear God, no confusion, is a real reward, uh, a real blessing that comes upon surrender. Clarity, no confusing, confusion. God wants us to have clarity related to what He's calling us to do. You know, things are not surrendered, sometimes hard to hear God, and God wants us to hear well. 
Another fruit of surrender, however you want to call it, is I think boldness. Yeah, boldness and also strength. Strength in opposition, strength in life. You know, there's this scripture in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Let's see if we can find it. Luke chapter 6. Almost there. Verse 46 onwards. It says here, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, part of surrender... Uh, will be obedience, isn't it? When, when he, is, he is Lord, when we surrender to Him, uh, we will do what He tells us to do, and it actually will provide tremendous strength. Uh, it will provide strength in spirit, yeah, to do what God has called us to do, to stand firm when things are hard. And so there's actually real consistency, I think, that comes in surrender. Uh, there is grace. I already mentioned that before. Yeah, we no longer wrestle with personal issues like personal freedom or whatever it is. Uh, there's actually a real surrender. And surrender is actually a form of humility, isn't it? I actually say, hey, I don't know it all. He actually knows it better than I do. He actually knows what he is up to. And so humility is always the pathway to grace. Humility is always the pathway to ability. And uh, I think there's exhortation in the Bible to make sure that we don't miss the grace. We can actually miss the grace. Isn't that incredible? You know, the grace that is so freely available, we can actually miss the grace. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 12, see to it that no one misses the grace of God that is available. Yeah, that no bitter roots spring up amongst you. It is this aspect that we can miss the grace, but God wants us to have grace. And, sur and, uh, and surrender really helps us to take hold of grace. Uh, freedom. There's real Freedom. In surrender, as we surrender to His Lordship, freedom to obey, whatever it means, you know, to be all that God wants us to be and to do all that God wants us to do. That's true freedom, isn't it? To, true freedom is to be able to do the call of God, whatever it is. Yeah, that's true freedom. You know, to stand up when others sit down. Stand up for God. You know, and when you look at this particular scripture that I mentioned before in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, it's this whole aspect, you know, where he talks about sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart so that you can actually give a defense for the hope that is within you. Yeah, there is hope that he has placed in us uh, that he wants us to really uh, stand firm on, that he wants us to actually stand up for. Uh, be free to stand up for God and stand up for truth. That's true freedom. Yeah, to be everything that God wants us to be, to be free to serve, to not be threatened by servanthood. Yeah, it's not about me. Inheritance, directly connected to surrender and fruit, having a fruitful life. If we surrender again, we obey. And the Bible's very clear. If you obey me, there will be blessing. Yeah, and now we're not doing it for the blessing. But there is a reward in obedience. Yeah, there is blessing. And it might not mean that you're going to be the richest person that has ever walked on earth financially. Yeah, but there is blessing in life. Blessing of relationship with God. Blessing of intimacy. Blessing of closeness with God. And guys, there's no better blessing than intimacy with God. Yeah, and I think people that are really surrendered to God, there's real, a real sense of intimacy that they walk in. And something that we grow in. And something that God wants us to grow in because we're aligned with Him. There's abundant life. Yeah. And I think people that, uh, that are surrendered uh, tend to finish what they started. Hey? People that are surrendered uh, tend to finish what they started. And so we can actually really see completion. You know, we can actually see things happen. We can see things spring forth. And I think it's such a reward. Yeah, as we do what God has called us to do, uh, to see uh, the things that He's planned for us, uh, to see them come to fulfillment. So I think there's fulfillment uh, related to surrender that God wants us to experience fulfillment. And so I just felt, you know, the simple, simple message tonight had to do with lordship and surrender, and that there's rewards for surrender, that He wants us to know those rewards as we walk in surrender to Him. And 
You know that scripture in 1 Peter, to actually sanctify Christ as Lord in our heart. Yeah, and that's an ongoing process. You know, we can wake up tomorrow morning and there might be something else that we need to sanctify. And that, that is a process that God takes us through. And for us to actually really be willing to go through that process, to say, hey, I want that process. I would never want to be afraid, personally. I would never want to be afraid or, or hesitant related to the process of sanctification of Christ as Lord in my heart. Because I know that that's where breakthrough lies. That's where intimacy lies. That's where the blessing of relationship with God and the relationship with others lie. And I want to be open to that. I never want to be close to that. I always want to say yes. Uh, I, w I need to continuously grow in that, you know, but... It's this aspect, I, I don't want to ever fight that. I don't want to ever fight uh, petty little fights related to issues of, of my personal will. Yeah. Um, am I perfect? No, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I'm still on a journey too, like we all are on a journey. But uh, I suppose, I feel like I've resolved in my heart that I, I want Christ as Lord to be sanctified in my heart. That's what I really long for. That's what I really want. Because ultimately, that's really where, where everything lies that we need and that God has for us. And I just wanted to encourage us to allow God, yeah, to do what He wants to do in that particular area. You know, and maybe there are some areas that you say, hey, maybe I'm not fully surrendered. Maybe you see some signs on the wall and you had no idea that you maybe weren't fully surrendered. And I'm not saying that all of these signs mean that you're not surrendered, but they could be. There could be areas where we still need to surrender to God. And uh, I just wanted to encourage us to allow God to do that, uh, not just tonight, but, you know, as we go into this next season, uh, we have new schools here, we have our guests here, uh, you know, as God takes us continuously forward into what He has for us, let's just be people that allow God, yeah, to walk us through that process of sanctification of Christ as Lord in our heart. Amen. I'll give it back to Caleb. <laughs>